delivery driver. So I set about it, put my head down, and took myself both into and out of an awful lot of trouble all the way around the world trying to reach the top. I had immediate success to begin with, but my rise through the ranks become ever more desperate, more insane, and more dangerous. But I do remember being here back in 1992 in my little Andrea Moda Formula One car trying to qualify for the British Grand Prix with the crowd cheering me on. So I did get to Formula One, but there was a twist. Twist? <laughs> yeah, I guess you can say that. This guy right here is Perry McCarthy. And if you don't know who this guy is, you're gonna know about him lickety split. Cause apart from being the original Stig on Top Gear when it was risen from the dead back in 2002, this guy was also a Formula One driver back in the 1990s. However, he was the driver for what has to have been the most messed up team in Formula One history. And I mean, that's why you're all here, right? So, let me tell you a little story. understand the full extent of this story, we have to go way back to its origins. Back when Andrea Moda was not Andrea Moda. Back in 1987, turbos were announced to be banned from the 1989 season onwards, thereby making the sport more affordable. If there is ever such a thing, Enzo Coloni loved the thought of this and jumped onto the opportunity without realizing that the whole gig may fall flat on its ass. Sure enough, it didn't matter whether they put a Ford or a Subaru engine in it, a good driver or a bad driver in it, the car never really qualified. Yeah, back then they had Subaru as an engine supplier, and that didn't do diddly to help their chances. I mean, by the time it was 1990, one. The team only had six people working for it. I mean, that staffing wouldn't be acceptable in a subway, let alone a Formula One team. The car was designed by university students and was called the C4. And being Italian, you can bet your soul that this thing blew up occasionally. Okay, maybe it did. But it is the stupidest name for a car since the Ocella fail. But I mean, I'm getting off track here. Eventually, Enzo realized what needed to be done. He announced that he sold the team to a mystery investor for eight million pounds. Once the last few races were complete, the mystery investor was finally revealed to be a man by the name of Andrea Sassetti. And now, this is where things get really screwed up. I mean, no, really, you're not prepared for this stuff. Sassetti was an Italian businessman who owned the shoe company, Andrea Moda. Not a lot is known about this company, even today, much like Rich Energy. I mean, I guess you could say that Sassetti was the original William Story. Instead of six people on the payroll, Sassetti bolstered that number to 40. However, some of these cats weren't what you would call experienced. He apparently hired some people from his shoe company to be part of the team. These people would screw the car together and drive them to and fro the circuit. They then transferred the headquarters from Perugia to the company's base in Moro Valley. Despite his lack of knowledge of pretty much anything, Sarsetti realized that he couldn't run with the colony that he had bought. Therefore, he paid Simtech to design a car for them, which eventually turned out to be the shunned BMW project from 1990. But they ain't in Formula 1 anymore and invest solely in thick GT cars now. However, the car itself wouldn't be ready for the first two Grand Prix of the season. So Sassetti resigned himself to the fact that they would have to run the C4s. So now it was just a matter of which driver was willing to step up into a car built on a tight budget by some mercurial Italians. The answer was more Italians, Alex Caffey and Enrico Battaglia. Sure, both drivers weren't bad, but you gotta remember at the same time, Alain Prost was in between jobs. Although, I'm pretty sure he would not have been vaguely interested in driving for this waste of hair and nipples. The team turned up in South Africa for the first round of the season, but they were far from ready. I mean, these clowns rocked up to the track sporting one proper car and another car which was an older Colony painted black and had the gutless Subaru engine in the back. Caffey ran around for a few laps before the FIA stepped in and told him that he couldn't do any more until Sassetti had paid the $100,000 deposit for new teams entering the championship. Sassetti, however, seemed to be under the illusion that his team was either not new or that these issues could be resolved by shouting profanities at overpaid Frenchmen. The FIA didn't take too kindly to this, and so the team would take no further part in the weekend, leaving Giovanna Amati to be the centerpiece for the Formula 1 freak show for the rest of the weekend. Their situation was made worse by the fact that as they were a new team, they couldn't use an older car that wasn't theirs as theirs. I mean, this would be ignored 28 years later with Racing Point, but I mean, for now, so City and his team needed Simtech to get a move on. I mean, for what it's worth, if there's one thing the team got right, it was the car. 
The S921. The livery was a tad boring, but it was nonetheless a sleek, good looking race car. The chassis wasn't half bad either, with one of its drivers stating in an interview that if the people I worked with at AGS had a chassis like Andrea Modders, they would have scored podiums, maybe even won races. The two entities work flat out to have the S921 completed in time for the second Grand Prix in Mexico. But it wasn't ready. The team withdrew due to extenuating circumstances. But really, the only reason they turned up was to avoid the $200,000 fine if they didn't turn up at all. Of course, everyone knew what a bloody mess the team was. Even the drivers, who spoke out against Sassetti and the team, claiming them to be ill-prepared and that they as drivers were not getting the track time they needed. Being the cool-headed, calm, collected Italian that he is, Sassetti responded to the scathing criticism by firing both drivers with immediate effect. An action you would expect of someone running with the Mafia. And that would be because he allegedly was. Don't make a f out of me. You want to embarrass me? Make a fool out of me? You see, no one really knows how this guy got his wealth. Your mind may turn to a shoe company, but some have suggested that he acquired his fortune through inheritance, through playing poker in the 80s, or through the aforementioned links with the Mafia. Of course, this is all unofficial history, but with the way Sassetti was acting, it's not as if he was convincingly dispelling these theories. Now that Andrea had played hooky with his two drivers, two more were needed, preferably ones that would be willing to put up with bullshit on a daily basis. The first driver he found was Roberto Marino, who performed well for Benetton in the previous year before getting shafted away for a future world champion, Michael Schumacher. And Marina had driven for the Coloni team before it was snapped up by Sassetti, so he at least had some anticipation for what was about to come. The other driver hired for the seat would be Perry McCarthy. On the face of things, McCarthy's career wasn't particularly notable. He competed in various events throughout Europe and the United States with relative success. His first taste of Formula 1 machinery came in 1991 when he tested for the Footwork Arrows team. And while he didn't press, a seat would not come about for him until that fateful day when Sassetti offered a seat, although the offer to race without having been paid was a pretty good deal for Andrea too. So the team headed to Brazil for what would effectively be their maiden hit out, although this would amount to much either, as Marina would potter around the track 23 seconds off the pace, and McCarthy, well this cat had a super license revoked at the last minute. Bruh. The team, nor McCarthy, could do diddly about that, and so the team had only one car to run with, but of course, they wouldn't qualify for the event, so they were out. Despite this unmitigated failure, Sassetti got a call from Enrico Bataggia, the bloke he just fired. Bataggia claimed to have come into possession of $1 million in sponsorship. Despite being well funded, Sassetti liked the idea of not paying people. After all, it was for that reason why he was given the heave ho in South Africa. Sassetti attempted to dump McCarthy as a result, but the FIA had caught on to these shenanigans and stated that only two driver changes per team per season was permitted. Huh? As a result, Moreno and McCarthy were the two Andrea Motor drivers for the season, whether Sassetti liked it or not. And Mr. Sassetti really didn't like that. So, he hatched a plan to get McCarthy to resign, and that plan was about as absurd as could be expected from a Mafia Link malcontent that designs shoes to fund a Grand Prix team that can't qualify. When it came time for the Spanish Grand Prix, the team left McCarthy at the hotel room as he overslept. This meant that he could barely make it to the Grand Prix circuit on his own, instead having to resort to haggle his way to the circuit. But it wouldn't have mattered even if he got there or not, because the team he was driving for was still just as hopeless as they were before. Marino's car couldn't even make manage a lap before the engine went bust, while McCarthy's car went pretty much nowhere. McCarthy's valiant efforts to push the car back were rewarded by having a somewhat live engine swapped out for Moreno's dead one. But in the case of poetic, automotive, f***ed up justice, that engine blew itself to pieces three laps later anyway. So needless to say, they didn't qualify for this race either. The San Marino Grand Prix wasn't totally bad, at least by their standards, but the real miracle came at the Monaco Grand Prix. I'm not exactly sure how they did it, but Roberto Marino managed to haul his car out of pre-qualifying and managed to qualify 26th overall to secure Andrea Motors' first Grand Prix start. For a team so monumentally wretched, it was a time to celebrate. I mean, you gotta hand it to Marino for actually managing to qualify the thing around Monaco. But for McCarthy, I'm pretty sure you can guess what happened there? Turns out these guys didn't even make a proper seat for him. When you're hurtling around Monaco in a car designed by school kids, with a team run by a mercurial Italian, what you don't want is blurry vision brought on by this. As a result, the outlook on paper was grim. Marino set a time of 127.186. Whereas McCarthy's time was over 17 minutes. 
Sure, this wasn't a sign of where he was as a driver, but it was a sign of just how much shit he was getting within the team. For Moreno, however, he got to start the race. He managed to work his way up to 19th place, albeit there were a few retirements to help him do that. But his engine gave up on lap 11, bringing an end to any hope the team would have had of getting any points. Having said that, a miracle would have been required, and seeing as how Andrea de Cesaris had already retired from the race, he couldn't help them out much more by causing another accident. This would be the team's high point. From here, things would get really messed up. While at one of his discos, Sassetti found himself in the midst of an assassination attempt, with the disco being torched and Sassetti being shot at. Apparently this was down to his ties with the Mafia, but I also wouldn't be surprised if it was McCarthy, or maybe it was orchestrated by the FIA, as these guys were getting fed up with Sassetti running his circus down the pit lane. When the team turned up in Montreal for the Canadian Grand Prix, they found that their cars didn't have the Judd V10s in the back of them, and there was a reason for this. Back in Europe, a storm cut the electricity to the airport and caused the flight to be grounded. Therefore, the freight was offloaded, leaving the engine stranded at the airport. So Seti was livid, and really, who could blame him? Not that this would be the last time the team would be screwed over by circumstances seemingly beyond their control. The eighth round of the championship took place at Money Core, and all teams and all personnel had rocked up to tackle the French circuit. Well, when I say all of them. The French, being French, has station blockades across multiple roads across the country, and Andrea Motor were pretty much the only team that couldn't bypass them. Although some speculated that this was pretty much just an excuse by Sassetti to save costs as they didn't turn up throughout the entire weekend. The rest of the team's sponsors must have thought this too, because pretty much all of them had hightailed out of there. Some of the staff, including team manager Frederic de... Yeah, no, I'm... Uh, yeah. had left the team too. It was clear therefore that the ship was sinking fast, not a pace that the team was particularly used to. At the British Grand Prix, the team decided to send McCarthy out on the track with wet tyres. The only problem with that is, the bloody track was dry. So needless to say, McCarthy ended up being well off the pace and not even close to qualifying. Having said that, Moreno didn't qualify either after the clutch exploded, so Sassetti and his miscreants were left with no option but to bugger off. At the Hungarian Grand Prix, the team had a chance to get out of pre-qualifying after Eric von der Poel had bailed on Brabham after what once was a great team had turned into a bumbling wreck just like Ferrari nowadays. This therefore meant that at least one of the Andrea Motors was gonna get out of pre-qualifying. So City had already come to the conclusion as to which one of these cars were gonna get into regular qualifying. And I think you can guess at this point that it wasn't gonna be McCarthy. So, the team decided to send him out on a track with only 45 seconds remaining. Now, you could put Ayrton Senna in that car. Hell, you can even get him to cut half the track while he's at it. But he wasn't gonna get that car around the track in 45 seconds, I'll tell you that for free. But if there's one thing that this stunt did do, it was arouse the attention of the FIA, as if they weren't already paying attention to this clown show. The consensus was, run McCarthy's car properly or don't bother turning up at all. But Sassetti didn't take heed to this. He really didn't care about the FIA or the people associated with them. He was only really out for himself. And come the Belgian Grand Prix, his hatred of McCarthy and his want to see him out of commission took a bloody dangerous turn. Marino wouldn't get anywhere near the top of the timing sheets or even the timing sheets at all. But McCarthy was still way behind him. But there was a reason for that. As McCarthy was going out for his lap, he applied the Tinder date mentality to his qualifying. Heading into Eau Rouge, the steering arm on his S921 was flexing. The steering seized up momentarily before heading up the hill, which would have resulted in a mass exodus of shit from his sphincter. When he told the team what happened, their reply was, oh yeah, that was on Roberto's car, so we just put it on yours. Now, <laughs> I know how we talk about certain teams giving certain drivers better parts than the other driver, but this was straight up attempted murder from Sassetti. Somebody needed to show Andrea that this sh** was not on. But before anyone could do that, the gendarmes came to arrest Sassetti for forging invoices. To think that this team could get themselves into that situation was inconceivable. A team built on a shoestring budget, running one car properly and trying to kill the other one, with a team principal allegedly tied up with the mob and being arrested in the paddock in front of everyone for forging invoices. What the f*** 
fuck is going on? Evidently, this was one step too far for the FIA, and these guys had finally had enough. The team was banned from the championship, with the FIA World Motorsport Council stating that the team would be banned on the regulatory grounds of failure to operate a team in a manner compatible with the standards of the championship, or in any way brings the championship into disrepute. The team turned up at Monza for the Italian Grand Prix, but they were turned away and thus brought an end to the Andrea Motor Formula 1 team. So, was this the worst Formula 1 team of all time? Well, one thing I can say is that Andrea Sassetti is the worst team principal of all time, in the same way that Bill Cosby is the worst babysitter of all time. This egotistic maniac ran the team like a dictator, terrified of losing his power, and throwing a fit as soon as things didn't go his way. What perhaps is more telling is that he managed to squander what was a decent platform, as the resources the team had were far better than the Colony shipwreck that he purchased just a year earlier. So, what happened to everyone after the whole thing fell through? Well, for Roberto Marino, he would return to the Formula 1 grid in 1995, driving for 40, another ill-prepared team that barely qualified. I mean, this thing still had a manual gearbox. In 1995, he would go on racing for a few more years before acting as a consultant and driver mentor for younger talent. As for Andrea Sassetti, well, let's just say that this shitstain still managed to make life miserable for those around him in the future years. He ran restaurants, nightclubs, and apartment complexes for a while, and was also involved in construction. So, a busy boy and still doing illegal stuff as he was recently under investigation for tax evasion. His Andrea Motor shoe brand, that we've become familiar with, is still around, albeit with only one store in Singapore. And to be honest, I don't even really know if this is still around. So said he would plaster that brand on another car in 1993, although it was in the Kart World Series, with the team either desperate for money or in dire need of getting into trouble. And finally, there is Perry McCarthy, the man who we saw at the start of this piece. Well, he tested for Williams and Ben after his stint at Andrea Moda, but he would never make a Grand Prix start. He competed in Le Mans for a while with limited success, but it was his role on Top Gear as the Stig that brought him back into the public eye. However, this came to an end promptly of him growing tired of the job, and annoyed by the fact that his employers refused to defend him whenever he got into trouble, kind of like what happened with his previous employer. Andrea Moda, giving their driver the cold shoulder, all in the name of naive bravado. I guess, now would be a good time to refer back to the question posed at the start of this video. What the f*** happened to Andrea Moda? The answer to that, what the f*** didn't happen to them? Over the years of Formula 1, many teams have come and gone. Some good, some bad, some just outright stupendous. But this team will be remembered for all the wrong reasons. It was the worst Formula 1 team of all time. Period. Maybe. Bugger it, roll credits. So if you like this video, give it a thumbs up, drop a comment below, and always remember, keep it respectful, be wholesome, don't be a manus, and as always, I'll see you all later.